I'm convinced, regardless of whether cars are powered by gasoline, diesel, hydrogen, or solar energy, one key fuel of the future for our industry will be data. Data changes everything from the customer experience to the culture of cooperation to business models. The mountain of data collected every day is incredibly huge. And if current studies are any guide, it will continue to grow by a factor of 10 by 2020. The key for turning the mountain of data into meaningful value added for the customer is the networking of data, also referred to as connectivity. What can the intelligent networking of data mean for the auto industry in specific terms? Let's start with the customers. One thing is clear, the better we know the customer and their wants and needs, the more personal our service can become. Amazon is a good example, obviously. If I order an air mattress, it is only logical that I could also use an air pump. This is convenient and useful. However, the suggestions are not always that innocent. For example, this is what Amazon German website recommends when you're looking for a window cutter. So gloves, a ski mask, and a baseball bat. <laughs> However, I'm not sure whether that says more about Amazon's algorithms or about German customers. <laughs> <clears throat> Obviously, connectivity is much more than that. The magic word is predictive. It's about anticipating the customer's behavior. And you don't need a supercomputer to anticipate one thing, connecting data is also the key to a great customer experience in my industry. Let me give you an example. When I'm on vacation, why can't my rental Mercedes know my mirror and seat settings or my favorite music before I get in? That would be a clear customer benefit of big data, and we're working on it. Our long-term vision is a learning car that progressively tailors itself to the driver. And that's important because the more functions a car is equipped with, the more complex it becomes. At some point, the dashboard might look like this. Just <laughs> between you and me, the only thing I find worthwhile in this picture are the controls for the autopilot. <laughs> we are working on that as well. The rest can go. If your smartphone only needs four buttons, then the Mercedes of tomorrow shouldn't have any more. That's why our team in Silicon Valley is working on dynamically displaying only those functions to the driver that he or she really uses. But what did you find, how did you find living in the United States compared to Germany, and what did you find uh, manufacturing cars in the United States compared to Germany? What was the difference? Well, first part, uh, not because I'm here and I have to be polite and friendly, um, this were about the best five years of our life uh, for the family and myself. Uh, my kids are half American and actually return her frequently, did uh, college time here on top afterwards and so on. So uh, we are kind of between the two worlds and I just like their, their ease of living and their uh, informal way of relating to each other. I just feel at home here. As far as business is concerned, um, always black and white, and these are all stereotypes and don't apply specifically like that, but uh, in general terms, um, in, in Germany, when we want to do something, we plan for the next three years, think about every alternative which could happen down the, uh, down the, um, the road, and, and then when we are finished with planning, then we start executing exactly to what we planned before. Um, here in the US, you just start and go, and then you learn by doing and improve. Um, and like always, uh, the best probably is in, in, the, in the midway. Um, as far, and, and this is something really important now for us. Um, for all these new businesses in the digital world, uh, you have to, speed is uh, essential, and you have to move forward, and you can come up with a better version, and you can be 80% fine, and then you do another download, and you get to 90%, and your customers are happy. Um, we cannot do that with the next S-Class. We still have to strive for the 
best car in the world and perfection is the name of the game. And you have to look for the last week and the last percentage of improvement to get this kind of a car. So we have to, on the one hand, maintain this kind of, of culture um, with our engineers and at the same time, the same company uh, do other parts of our business just on a speed speed and let's take some risk and go forward basis. And uh, this is on the one hand a challenge, on the other hand again a tremendous opportunity. If we succeed to combine these two strengths, the sky is the limit. Let me ask you, in Germany uh, there's a big uh, refugee influx from Syria. Has that affected your company in any way or not? Uh, well, not to be too lengthy with my answer, um, we have in Germany a demography uh, which will lead to a reduction of population of uh, millions and millions in the foreseeable future. Uh, I don't know any um, economic model which uh, works on the premise of negative growth. Uh, so we are in desperate need of immigration for Germany. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, crises uh, relatively close to Europe, uh, in the first place in Syria, uh, where people are threatened for their life on a daily basis and live in terrible uh, situations if they continue to live. And many of these are fleeing. And uh, now two things come together. On the one hand, the humanitarian um, <coughs> responsibility to help these people and give them shelter. On the other hand, the need for people to help Germany to continue to stay as it is and grow. Okay. So um, I have publicly stated that I think this is a real opportunity and that this might even lead, lead to another economic miracle in Germany, just as it happened 30, 40 years ago when many so-called Gastarbeiter at that time, millions came to Germany to help us grow our economy. Um, of course, there are tremendous tasks on hand and of course it's not easy at all when week by week uh, 10,000 or even 100,000 of people come into a country and you have to find places uh, where they can sleep and so on. That is all but easy. But uh, I think there's no choice but the direction which our chancellor has decided to go for and I'm totally supportive of that. Okay. And we help with our company to the extent we can. Uh, so we have um, so-called bridging apprentices ships where we um, have uh, newly come refugees um, giving them their first job opportunity and train them, educate them. Uh, we contribute with money. We, where we have space, uh, spare room, we offer that for shelter and so on. Okay. In fact, this building, until 1989, the home of the East German State Council, is a perfect place to underline, if you don't think disruptive about your own organization, someone else might take that responsibility. And we also know many examples of big traditional companies that did not survive a fundamental technological shift in their market. For instance, none of the big steam locomotive manufacturers were in existence when the transition or transformation to diesel or then electric locomotives occurred. At Daimler, we are well aware of this. In fact, our company was founded on a very disruptive idea 130 years ago. It's a remarkable coincidence. The father of Carl Benz, our company's co-founder, was a steam locomotive driver. At that time, people used to say he was in an honorable profession. But due in part to his son's invention of the car back in 1886, he was also in an occupation that no longer had a promising future. So does that mean changing an established industry is a bad thing? No, I don't think so. I'm convinced it's the responsibility of any leader in business or society to make sure that their children can say, our parents had an honorable profession and they kept reinventing it for an even more promising future. Our approach to this change of culture and for more risk-taking and agility, we call Leadership 2020. And the approach to that um, is very different than what we did in the past. Of course, we had many transformation processes and they had their merits, but typically the majority of the employees sat in their corner and said, well, let's wait, this will go away as well, and then we can continue to do our work. Uh, this time it's different. Wherever I go, uh, 
people ask me, help us, help us for change, because we have the ideas, but this company doesn't allow us to progress fast enough and sufficiently unbureaucratic. And therefore, we took a different approach. Um, we asked via intranet our people who wants to participate in transforming our company into a new future as far as our culture is concerned. And uh, within a few hours, more than 1,000 peop people applied around the globe. Uh, and 144 of them were selected in eight groups who represented the entire company globally uh, from gender, from age, from hierarchy in all aspects. And we gave them the task, we are an automotive company, to develop eight prototypes, one in each group, for a new leadership model for the future. And the only constraint we gave them, there is none. Um, they worked first uh, virtually around the globe and then met at different places in the world to come up with these eight prototypes. Then two of each group joined together in one group of 16 who then condensed these eight prototypes in one. And then we had one workshop a uh, full day with the board and they presented us a huge amount uh, of great ideas, eight leadership principles and then clusters of game changers, uh, which are pretty substantial. And they wondered if we would accept any one of them. Um, we ticked off the eight leadership principles this very day with slight modifications. And then we named a sponsor for each of these game changer clusters out of the board um, and approved 80% of them on this very same day. Um, there result of this approach is, is mind-buckling for me. It was one of the most exciting days I have um, experienced. Uh, I, for instance, uh, took the mentorship for the cluster um, swarm organization. And I encourage my seven colleagues to each of them commit to apply this system to a, a significant part of their organization. So we want in the short term transform about 20% of our huge 130-year-old company uh, into, with the principle of swarm organization, hierarchy-free, and so on. So we are talking about pretty substantial change, which is driven from bottom up, driven by the people who need it. And now it's our job to sell that to our leaders as well, uh, who might not all of them be enthusiastic uh, by the first day, but they are much more convinced by their colleagues having developed that than by the board. By the way, we were lucky because we didn't know if they, in their prototypes, thought they would still need a board. But uh, <laughs> obviously, so far, yes. Um, so uh, for me, the most important conclusion of this um, exercise was that there's a broad understanding that never change a winning team, a running system, may be a strategy to avoid trouble with your home computer, but definitely not for a big organization anymore. It's a recipe for disaster for any company, especially when it's running well, and when typically the most significant management mistakes are made uh, when success seems to prove that things are going right.